Judge J. Wadey's Waring was an eighth generation Charlestonian and the son of a Confederate soldier who became a U.S. District Court judge in Charleston, South Carolina. Despite his immersion in a culture steeped in racism and oppression, Waring spent his career expanding American civil liberties. His rulings greatly improved the lives of African Americans by establishing equal pay for teachers in Charleston, ending the all-white Democratic primary in South Carolina, and inspiring the Supreme Court ruling in Brown v. the Board of Education. Waring also contributed to the common good of South Carolina by ending segregation in his own courtroom well before it was the law of the land and continuing to work as an activist for equality for the duration of his life. Here is Judge Waring speaking in an interview with Martin Luther King Jr. on the meaning of the end of segregation. It declared in effect that segregation, legal segregation, segregation by law is illegal and not a part of American system. And all the people, the big people and the little people throughout this land have awakened to the fact that they have a right. Now remember this, it's not a matter of giving. Rights. Rights aren't given. The right to vote isn't given to you. It's yours. And it belongs to you. And the Negro people are beginning to realize that they are ordinary human beings and American citizens and they have these rights. And the courts have told them so. Now it's up to them to move out. They haven't got to go out with guns and bombs and bayonets, but they've got to go out with determination and courage and steadfastness, like this man Luther King has done, and say, here am I, and I stand here on my rights. In 1943, Judge Waring heard one of his first civil rights cases. Thurgood Marshall, a young lawyer for the NAACP, brought forth the case of Viola Duvall, an African-American school teacher in Charleston. Though Duvall had earned the highest teaching certificate possible and was the best paid educator among her African-American cohort, she earned $645 a year while the lowest paid white teacher earned $1,100 a year. Marshall would later say, When I took the teacher's salary case, I regarded Judge Waring as just another Southern jurist who would give me the usual head whipping before I went along to the Circuit Court of Appeals. Turned out to be the only case I ever tried, with my mouth hanging open half of the time. Judge Waring stated that the 14th Amendment was still in the Constitution, and that it still prevailed for all citizens in his court. Waring found in favor of Duvall and demanded equal pay for equal qualifications, regardless of race. Judge Waring then heard the case of George Elmore, a black man who was denied his constitutional right to vote in the South Carolina Democratic primary. In his ruling that ended the all-white Democratic primary, Waring stated that all citizens of this state and country are entitled to cast a free and untrammeled ballot. This was an uncommon and unpopular opinion for a white South Carolinian in 1947. One month after the ruling, 35,000 blacks cast their votes for the first time in the Democratic primary. Judge Waring's largest impact on the expansion of civil liberties came from his dissent of the Briggs v. Elliott ruling in 1952. The arguments made in Waring's dissent would later be used by the United States Supreme Court justices in their ruling on the Brown v. Board of Education. Separate but equal was failing black families across the nation, but nowhere more so than in South Carolina. In Clarendon County, where the Briggs v. Elliott case originated, the school system spent $179 on each white child and only $43 per black child. The Briggs case was named for Harry Briggs, one of 20 parents who brought the suit against the school board of Clarendon County. In the case, Thurgood Marshall, a lawyer for the NAACP, originally only asked the county to provide school buses for the black students, as they did for the white students. His focus was on the equality portion of the separate but equal clause. However, Judge Waring told the lawyer he was aiming too low. As long as you have separate, Waring said, you will never have equality. So go back and amend your case and come back and challenge segregation itself. The three-judge panel that heard Briggs v. Elliott denied the plaintiff's request to abolish school segregation. 
Instead, they ordered the school board to begin equalization of the schools. In a lone dissenting opinion, Judge Julius Waring adamantly opposed segregation in public education. His lengthy and well-argued dissent would be used by the Supreme Court in Brown versus the Board of Education four years later. Although Waring was outvoted in Briggs v. Elliott, he understood that the ruling of any three-judge panel was automatically appealed to the U.S. Supreme Court. In his maneuvering of the case, Waring put the issue of segregation on the docket of the country's highest court. Four years after Briggs v. Elliott, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled against segregation in Brown v. the Board of Education. We conclude that in the field of public education, the doctrine of separate but equal has no place. Separate educational facilities are inherently unequal. This phrase sounds strikingly similar to Waring's statement that segregation is per se inequality. Judge Waring continued his fight against segregation long after he wrote the Briggs v. Elliott dissent. He understood that the fight for integration had just begun with the Brown v. Board ruling and that the southern states would have to be forced to integrate their schools and public spaces. In the following interview, Waring discusses the importance of holding politicians accountable for integration. No politician in the South is going to dare come out and uh, take this position of his own volition. But if the President of the United States tells him so, he's going to fall in line. And uh, if we can get the top executive people to take action, we'll get somewhere. Remember this, uh, the Supreme Court has laid down the law and said what's constitutional. Now that's important. That's most important. It's the, it's the biggest thing that's ever happened. But it's got to be activated. It's got to be worked out. And the executive department has got to manipulate and work it and enforce it. And the legislative department should give the executive department more power to work and enforce these laws. Judge Waring's rulings came at a high cost to himself and his wife, Elizabeth. They received threatening phone calls on a nightly basis. Men accosted Elizabeth on the street and yelled obscenities at her. Charleston politicians petitioned for Waring's impeachment. Someone burned a cross in their front yard and threw bricks through their windows. And in 1950, the South Carolina General Assembly passed a joint resolution to remove the Waring's from the state and erect a plaque to the couple in the mule barn at Clipson College. When asked about the violence, and his exile from the South, Waring said, I think I'm enormously fortunate because you don't often in life have an opportunity to do something that you think is good. Some might argue that Judge Waring's rulings pushed South Carolina and the rest of the nation too far, too fast. After his rulings and the Brown v. Board decision, there was a resurgence of the Ku Klux Klan across the South and a steep increase in violence and racial vitriol towards blacks. However, many across the South were in support of Judge Waring's rulings, even if they would not voice that support. He received many letters from South Carolinians, white and black, telling him to keep fighting. Waring knew there was a great silent South out there, and the loudest voices weren't necessarily the best voices in the South. Officially, I was quite busy and uh, condemned because I had uh, I had expressed my views to what I thought the laws of the land were. And I got a lot of telephone messages and anonymous letters saying they agreed with me, but they couldn't tell me why or how or who they were. Waring served as the voice of so many who could not or would not speak out. In a letter, journalist Carl Rowan told Waring that the cause you fight is that of every Negro, every American, every human being. In 2015, the South Carolina House of Representatives passed a bill to designate the U.S. Courthouse in Charleston as the J. Wadey's Waring Judicial Center. Attorney General Eric Holder spoke at the dedication. From striking down a white-only white state primer, proposing the proper vehicle for Thurgood, Thurgood Marshall to put the, the central, central question of Briggs to test, test. Judge Waring decisively advanced, advanced the cause of equal rights. He challenged systems of inferiority and obsession. And in doing so, he brought our nation closer to its highest ideals. Judge Waring died in New York City in 1968. His last request was to be buried in the Magnolia Cemetery in Charleston. A local newspaper said the following in closing its article on Judge Waring. Waring is not a household name today. 
but some people have never forgotten his work. When the hearse carrying the judge passed through the gates of Magnolia Cemetery, 200 black residents fell in line behind it and walked wearing to his grave. I'm going to tell you that everywhere I go, I'm going to let it shine. It's been a long, a long time coming, but I know a change gonna come. Oh, yes, it's real.